With bombs placed on the grounds of BC's legislature set to go off on Canada Day, it could have been a deadly terror attack. But it was a plot the RCMP claimed it thwarted. But then the Mounties case came crashing down. The B.C. Supreme Court ruled the so-called homegrown terrorists were in fact hapless stooges to a conspiracy orchestrated by the Mounties. W5's Victor Malaric investigates the plot and the bungled case, including an exclusive interview with a husband and wife at the center of it. I'm thinking about full on like 9-11 here. You know what I'm thinking? Of course. These are the people here that, that need punishment. They're the ones who should be butchered and killed. When you say the kinds of things John Nuttall was saying in 2013, it tends to raise alarm bells. I'll kill as many of those bastards as I can. Yeah. What you're seeing is video gathered by the RCMP during an elaborate undercover investigation called Project Souvenir. The man Nottle thinks is a big shot financier connected to an international terrorist network is actually a Mountie. Let's talk seriously. You want to do something? Yes or no? Yes. Their relationship culminated in Nuttall and his wife Amanda Carodi creeping around the grounds of BC's provincial legislature in Victoria early on the morning of Canada Day 2013. North side of the legislature, the target with a black duffel bag. They planted what they thought were bombs in the bushes and waited. But the explosions never came. And the following day, the RCMP held a news conference announcing they had foiled a major terrorist attack and arrested the man and woman behind it. On July 1st, the RCMP arrested and charged John Stuart Nuttall and Amanda Cordy for terrorism-related activities. The RCMP had been tipped off that John Nuttall was a potential security risk by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service in early February of 2013. At the time, Phil Gursky was working at the spy agency as an analyst. So CSIS basically says, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, this guy's up to something, you might want to look into it. Well, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and then the RCMP launch Project Souvenir. That's correct. So you think that John Nuttall was the real deal? As a radicalized individual who was planning an attack, absolutely. John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi, a husband and wife team of Canadian Muslim converts, were quickly arrested, charged, and put on trial. Inside the lair of two suspected terrorists. The case made for sensational headlines. The jury heard Nadal and Karodi planning the attack. I'm doing this of my own free will. And saw them planting the bombs in living color. On June 2nd, 2015, John Nadal and Amanda Karodi were convicted and faced life in prison. Nadal's lawyer, Marilyn Sanford, was skeptical right from the beginning. You hear about Operation Souvenir, and then you meet up with John Nuttall. Any red flags go up? Right away, for sure. I was interested already in the press reports before I became counsel a few weeks later, because it just sounded so strange. As more information came out about the accused terrorist, it got stranger. Their apartment was a shambles, littered with garbage and bottles of methadone they were taking for their heroin addiction. Karodi's lawyer, Mark Jetty, says they didn't seem capable of putting a terrorist plot together. It seems hard to imagine that they could because they weren't capable of, of keeping their lives together, uh, let alone doing something as complex as organizing and then executing a, a terrorist plot. Um, and that became apparent, uh, it seemed to me, or should have become apparent to the police during the course of the investigation. A year later, in an incredible reversal of fortune, Justice Catherine Bruce ruled not all in Karoti had been entrapped and set them free. In a scathing decision, she wrote the RCMP had manipulated two vulnerable people into committing a terrorist attack. Simply put, the world has enough terrorists. We do not need the police to create more out of marginalized people who have neither the capacity nor sufficient motivation to do it themselves. So how in the world could this have happened, and why? 
Now, through dozens of hours of undercover video gathered by the RCMP and an exclusive sit-down interview with John Nuttall and Amanda Carotti, we can tell you the whole sordid story. When you were sitting in the courtroom and listening to everything going on, were lights going on and saying to you, oh my God, this whole thing was a setup from start to finish? Yeah, it was just, the, the whole thing was just so conniving from the very beginning, from the very get-go. You don't just wake up one morning and decide to be a bomber. Like, these guys groomed us for six months, you know, to do this. The RCMP's undercover operation started in late February of 2013 with what seemed like a chance meeting. But in reality, it was meticulously planned right down to the last detail. How did the idea come up for you and John to get involved in, in a terrorist plot? We saw videos of Palestinian children with their legs blown off and, and horrible things like that. And we wanted to do something to, to help put a stop to it. Does that say to you at some point, I want to get involved in a jihad? No, it wasn't like that in the beginning. The undercover operator in the car with Nuttall is referred to in court records as Officer A, but he presented himself as a Muslim from the Middle East. They met at this gas station a few blocks away from the basement apartment Nuttall shared with Karoti in Surrey, B.C. Either the first or second time that they met, he, he gave him some money, and we were in poverty, and we didn't have very much to eat, and so that was an amazing gift. I think he gave him, like, either one or two hundred dollars. Over the following weeks, there were trips for coffee, discussions of the Middle East, and the oppression of Muslims around the world. Over time, through skillful manipulation, their bond grew. As a recent convert to Islam, not all came to rely on Officer A for religious guidance. Sanford says it's obvious her client was desperate to impress his new friend. On the videotapes, you can see that these are people who were new converts, that these were people who were already fairly socially isolated and became more so, that they were unsophisticated, gullible, naive. The RCMP, in fact, were well aware how isolated Nuttall and Karodi felt, because Nuttall kept telling them. We're used to being cooped up in our house. We never go outside. We keep the, the blinds closed. We, we don't answer our phone unless we're expecting a call. We were ghosts. The only people that, that even know that we exist is you. Jetty believes the couple's isolation allowed undercover operators to manipulate them. He established a very close relationship with Nuttall fairly early on in the operation, where Nuttall seems quite devoted to him and very much uh, under his direction. You can call me anytime you want. With the relationship firmly established, the conversation gradually began to turn to jihad. And by early May 2013, the RCMP was ready to move the operation forward and see just how far Nuttall and Karoti were willing to go. I was supposed to come up with a plan, and I didn't come up with a plan. I had like three days or so to come up with a plan. And I just spent the whole time playing video games and smoking weed. Not all was supposed to research a plot. His idea would then be passed on to another member of the terrorist cell at a meeting in Whistler. But there was no planning done, so Not all quickly wrote down the first thing that came to mind. I started typing on my laptop a plan how to how we could save Omar Khadr from Guantanamo Bay by hijacking a via rail train. And along with him, we demand the closure of Guantanamo Bay and the release of every single prisoner there. It was an unrealistic plan, to be sure. But the biggest problem with it was the train not all talked about hijacking in Victoria had long since gone out of service. Listen, 
Let me finish. The next time they met, Nuttall's handler wasn't pleased. Do you know that that train is no more for passenger? Oh, it isn't? No. No, I haven't been on that train in uh, two years. Okay. It was just because an idea I came up with on... Okay, I, feel, I, I, I understand it was just an idea. Just an idea. Okay. Then that train is no more. It's just now, it's just cargo. There are no more passengers. All right, all right. This thing has to be prepared. It has to be researched. It don't work like that. What are you doing? Over the following weeks, the undercover operator became more aggressive in suggesting Nuttall come up with a viable plan. But most of his ideas were ludicrous. I was thinking, man, we could take the base, we'd have control of nuclear submarines, man, then we could threaten everybody. Withdraw your troops now. I want to storm the base and, and take them by utter surprise. Okay? Headshot, 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 pop, pop, pop. I'm thinking of all the big picture here and how I can influence basically what's going to be World War III and, and the Mahdi is going to be coming very soon. I know it, I feel it. The one plan that, that we actually came up with was this plan to fire rockets, homemade rockets like the Palestinians make that would say Free Palestine on the side. And we even suggested that they be unarmed rockets just to be well, if symbolic. they exploded, then how would you be able to read the wording on the side, Free Palestine? Nobody would be able to understand the message if they exploded. Attempts to get Nuttall to focus on a feasible plan failed time and time again during the course of Project Souvenir. And it wasn't long before the undercover operator began to get frustrated and push for results. You want to do something? Yes. Now, if you want to do it, you have to think about it. How physical is it? Do your research. Do everything. Treat them more in general. Brother, I'm not a general. I'm not. I, I'm maybe a. a I'm someone who can command a team, but not an army. I'm, I don't. Yes, I think it's time to leave it. We were trying to impress our new friends, you know, with some big talk. Basically stuck our foots in our mouths and, and then they started saying, well... Uh, come up with a plan. Come up with a plan. And then they would say it was our plan and that we planned it, but you know, re the truth is, is we only came up with these plans because they told us to come up with these plans. A difficult past. I was a drug addict most of my life. Makes an easy mark. Was John Nuttall pushed to radicalization? Absolutely. When W5 continues. For four months, John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi were targeted in a massive undercover investigation that ended with the RCMP accusing the pair of trying to commit a terrorist act. But the court ruled Nuttall and Carodi were entrapped and set them free. They haven't had much to say publicly since then, until we sat down with them for what turned out to be a bizarre interview. Tell me a bit about your childhood growing up. Um. Was it a difficult childhood? Um, sometimes. You've had drug issues. Yeah. When did you get involved in drugs? Um, we're not really supposed to talk about our sins. Uh, you don't want to talk about your sins? Yeah, like after you become a Muslim, uh, all your sins are forgiven, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was a drug addict for uh, most of my life. What kind of drugs did you do? I did pretty much all the drugs that are known to man. Yeah. Then not all became agitated about the personal questions we were asking. Can we hang on a sec? And looked to his lawyer for help. 
Like, I feel like you guys aren't giving me any help at all here. I feel like uh, I'm getting, I'm all by myself here. Well, and this, this I've probably incriminated myself enough already, so... No, you haven't. Um, what has come out has already come out in the courts. There's, not, there's no mystery here. At this point, not all left the room. We weren't sure he'd be coming back. Nobody's helping me. He eventually did return, and we moved on to other questions. Long before Project Souvenir, John Nuttall had an unstable childhood, followed by a rocky adulthood. Music was the one place where he found refuge, playing in several punk bands in Victoria. But he also got hooked on drugs and racked up multiple criminal convictions for assault and robbery between 1995 and 2003. Amanda Carodi's lawyer, Mark Jetty, says by the time his client met John Nuttall, both had fallen into self-destructive patterns. They had lived on the streets for an extended period of time. Um, they both had drug problems, um, which continued through the undercover operation. They'd had issues uh, with mental health, uh, the two of them. Nuttall and Karodi eventually converted to Islam, moved into a basement suite in Surrey, and started treatment for their drug addiction. But the religious awakening also made Nuttall hesitant about committing a terrorist act. So he turned to the only person he thought he could talk to for spiritual advice, the RCMP undercover operator. I have questions and I, I reach out to brothers on the internet for it because I don't know anyone else I can talk to. Is haram or halal to blow yourself up? What if I go to hell for what I'm going to do? We asked them to put us in touch with a spiritual advisor. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll put you in touch with my spiritual advisor. I'll get you in touch with him. But he never did. Instead of putting Nuttall in touch with an imam, the RCMP did the opposite. He told us not to go and talk to imams at other mosques. This is why I say Mr. Nuttall would not have radicalized on his own had it not been for the RCMP. Omid Safi is the director of Islamic studies at Duke University in North Carolina and testified for the defense. He believes the RCMP deliberately isolated Nuttall from spiritual counsel in order to keep him on the path to committing a terrorist attack. On a number of occasions, John Nuttall says, let's just go to a mosque. And the undercover officers again and again say, why do you want to go to a mosque? Why do you want to talk to one of these people? You're just as good as they are. Instead of allowing Nuttall to see an imam, this is the advice Officer A gave to Nuttall, a recovering drug addict on methadone and clearly struggling to stay awake. And we don't have to forget that our God is predetermined by Allah. Allah chooses it for us. We don't choose it for ourselves. Classical Islamic thought rejected the notion of don't worry about it because God has already decided it as negating the reality of human free will. Any imam in any mosque that has ever studied the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet would be expected to say, the Prophet does not allow you to carry out indiscriminate action that will cause harm to non-combatants. Do you think that looking at this case that John Nuttall was pushed to radicalization? Absolutely without a hesitation. Most of Nuttall's attack plans centered around Victoria, so Officer A took he and Karodi on a reconnaissance mission to Vancouver Island. But on the ferry ride, he continued to express religious doubts. His lawyer, Marilyn Sanford, argues that was one of many key moments when the RCMP should have re-evaluated their operation. If Mr. Nuttall really, truly uh, w wanted to proceed with this operation, then why at so many critical points is he having these cries of conscience and bringing them to the, to the operator and saying, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to do? It's not the behavior you expect of a, <laughs> a terrorist. In fact, the RCMP didn't trust Nuttall to behave with the caution you'd expect from a terrorist with religious advisors or anyone else. We weren't allowed to talk to anyone else about it. It was like he had isolated us from everyone. Mr. Nuttall wanted to meet with his mother, and uh, he had other family there as well, and the undercover operators essentially told him, no, that's not going to happen. 
Here, let me take a picture of you. Despite all their handler's warnings to stay under the radar, not all in Karoti did the opposite. On the day of the reconnaissance mission, he walked around the grounds of the BC legislature, filming this video while chatting to police. And is that guy really gold? He's gold plated? I, I already solid gold. No, wouldn't that be nice? We are Queen Victoria. He even called attention to himself during a tour. Long live the Queen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. They weren't focused or serious and certainly not behaving in a way that you would behave if you're, if you're a serious <laughs> terrorist. clandestine terrorist, uh, you wouldn't do the things that they did, uh, which were basically the, um, doing things to draw attention to themselves in very, very public places. And at the end of the trip to Victoria, they were no closer to coming up with a detailed plan of attack than before. But once again, the RCMP decided to ramp up the drama in their fictional plot. <laughs> Unlikely terrorists. These people are not necessarily the sharpest pencils in the box. Stalled by inept planning. Did you get two meals? Uh, no, we need to get the meals. When W5 continues. Welcome back. So let's recap our story to this point. After more than three months of an undercover operation, the Mounties attempt to turn two hapless Canadian Muslim converts into jihadi terrorists was going nowhere. But the Mounties weren't giving up. They thought with the right prodding, John Nuttall and Amanda Karodi could still come up with a viable terror plot. Victor Malarik continues our reporting. April 15, 2013. Pressure cooker bombs explode during the Boston Marathon, killing three people and injuring dozens more. Less than two months later, after coming up with several unworkable plans, a light finally went on in John Nuttall's head. Yeah, that's what they used in the Boston bombings. That's the same bomb they used. Using pressure cooker bombs was the first feasible idea not all had come up with. So, to hammer that plan home, the RCMP brought in another undercover operator not all had met before. Uh, we're so happy to see you, brother. Not all was so thrilled to spend time with another Muslim brother that he was apparently oblivious to the fact that two undercover officers were teaming up to push him to act on the pressure cooker plan. I was really. I, I'm really excited because it's something that can work for sure. It's visible, it's very it realistic. Yeah, so uh, I was glad to see that you're starting to think, you know, starting to think about that, you know. But later in the hotel, Nuttall's mind began to wander back to his old plan to build and fire homemade rockets, a plan that had already been rejected. You know, do you have a, a, a real plan, something realistic that you're going to do, or, or if that's... We have what we've come up know. with and told you about. Yeah, I'm not even worried about that, because that, that, that would take forever. Eventually, with more prodding, not all is convinced to change his mind again. Now, which, are you going with the pressure cooker? After yes. that, I, I believe that that's what he says we should do. All not all was required to do was build the bombs. His RCMP handlers promised to supply the explosives. They drove Nuttall around to buy bomb parts that were readily available in stores. But Nuttall even had trouble doing that simple task. Did you get two nails? Uh, no, we need to get the nails. A short time later, Nuttall returns to the car, again without the nails he went to get. I forgot even what we're talking about, brother. Oh, you know I'm not even focused any stuff. I need a lot to help me think. I was what? Thinking about what? Okay, five nails. Yeah. In the end, the shopping trip that should have taken a few hours took three days. What else? By June 28th, just three days before Canada Day, this is what the RCMP were watching. John Nuttall, fumbling around in a hotel room in his underwear, 
struggling to build timers for the pressure cooker bombs. It looks like a ridiculous parody of a Hollywood movie. But as the reality of the situation finally began to sink in, it's clear that Nuttall and Karoti were terrified. You know what's gonna happen if we don't come up with this? He's gonna turn from a real nice guy into a monster, okay? Has it occurred to you that he has a fourth contingency plan? It involves us wearing cement galoshes at the bottom of the ocean. The RCMP undercover officers did offer Nuttall and Karoti a chance to back out on several occasions, but they always refused. If you don't want to do it, nobody... Yes, I want to. Nobody is forcing you to do that. Do. And don't forget that. If you say, I still have doubt in my heart, Arashi, I cannot do this, we're still brother at the end. When you heard the undercover officer offer you an out, hey, you don't have to do this if you don't want, why didn't you take it? If we said, yeah, okay, we don't want to do it, uh, we'll take the out, are you sure about that, brother? Yeah, I'm sure I, I want to take the out. Okay, then, I'm sorry I have to do this. Bang! You know? We thought that it was either follow through with the plan or take a dirt nap. Looming over everything was a meeting with the leader of the terrorist cell Nuttall and Karoli believed they were mixed up with. This was the man who would have to approve the plan and supply the explosives. He was known as the boss. The RCMP called him Mr. Big. In RCMP circles, bringing in an officer posing as a powerful underworld figure to meet the target is usually called a Mr. Big operation. Karoli's lawyer, Mark Jetty, says usually the controversial technique is used to elicit a confession for a crime already committed. Here they bring in somebody who is presented as a powerful and superior member of this international um, terrorist organization um, who's there to meet them um, and listen to their plan and ultimately endorse or not endorse their plan. Something completely different from the traditional Mr. Big. It's completely different. It's using some of those powerful techniques, but in a whole different way. This was Nuttall's big chance to impress a powerful international terrorist. But even after building the pressure cooker devices, Nuttall still couldn't keep his mind focused on the plan. The greatest thing I wanted to do was to build Qasem rockets, just like the Palestinians did, mm -hmm. and attack the, the naval base in Esquimalt. Right. OK. And uh, kill as many of those bastards as I can. Soldiers? Yeah. Not all also seems to be unsure of the date the attack will be carried out, even though it's less than two days away. Well, he, sorry, he also said you had a timeline. What is, what is your, what is the, yeah, he was fucked. Ask him. Uh -huh. That's what I thought was your idea. Uh, I there. <laughs> no, no, that was your idea about it. At this point, the supposed boss leaves the room, followed by Officer A. They have a heated conversation out of camera range, but it's a ruse meant to turn the pressure up on their target. It's just a waste of my time. Yeah, you know, I'll come along and wait for this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm not happy. When Officer A comes back and tells Nuttall the boss is angry, he falls right into their trap and begs for help. I want to fight. My wife wants to fight. We can fight. You can fight. You can help us. Please help us. Mr. Big reluctantly agrees to support the plan. And now, there's no turning back. No, we have a plan. Later that night, in the hotel room paid for by the RCMP, in front of an Al-Qaeda flag supplied by the RCMP, and with an undercover officer running the camera, Nadal and Karoti record their martyr video. This is a war they've declared on Islam. So we're going to fight back with everything we've got, even if it means losing our lives and our loved ones. This is what we are doing. On June 30th, Nuttall and Karoti still didn't know if they could really go through with the plan to plant the bombs at the legislature on Canada Day. It doesn't seem real. I have that same feeling, it's surreal. 
Even on the last day, like two hours before we were going out to plant the bombs, we considered calling the cops on these people, you know. But as the sun sets and darkness descends, they realize it's too late to get away and too late to call it off. We have no option. We have no way out. We have to do it. A wave of doubt. I don't want to kill no kids. But the planning goes on. They certainly had the intent. They certainly had the ideology. And they had the capability. When W5 continues. As the sun rises on July 1st, 2013, Project Souvenir is about to come to its carefully orchestrated conclusion. At first light, John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi are dropped off by their RCMP handler to plant the bombs on the grounds of the BC legislature. There are multiple cameras recording their every step. North side of the legislature, the target with a black duffel bag. They walk up to bushes at either end of the grounds and plant the pressure cookers they believe are filled with explosives and nails that will create deadly shrapnel. In reality, there was never any danger because the Mounties only put a minuscule amount of explosives in each device and the detonators were fake. Stand by, I have target boarding the white van. With the bombs planted, Officer A picks up Nuttall, who thinks he's made a clean getaway. Okay, let's go pick up the system. Oh, he's in a bush. That bush, there was a, two, there was a bum sleeping in the bush. Oh, it's like, he didn't see Did he see you? He woke up, and he's like, what's that? Open to the system, my friend. Hide it. No one's going to see it. From there, Nuttall and Karoti are whisked off to the ferry and taken to this hotel in a suburb of Vancouver. Once inside, they sit down in front of the TV, expecting to see news of the explosion. Somebody's going to come on and say, we interrupt this program with an emergency news bulletin. But as they count down to detonation, nothing happens. Canada Day celebrations are in full swing, and now Nuttall and Karoti are terrified that the bombs will go off at the wrong time. What if it goes off during the time when children are there? I don't want to kill the kids. What if it goes off now? The kids are there right now. Are you thinking to yourself, I don't want to do this, why am I doing this, or... Please, I... God, don't let anyone get hurt. Please, uh... God. Make something happen, anything. Finally, something does happen. Officer A calls and tells Nuttall and Karoti to meet him outside. And suddenly at 1.54 p.m., Project Souvenir is over. When we were arrested, I was, my first uh, emotion was relief. That nobody was killed? Yeah. That nobody was hurt? Yeah. Yeah. After being arrested, charged, and convicted, Nuttall and Karoti were facing life in prison. CTV News. But before a sentence could be handed down, Tonight a bombshell. News, terrorism convictions overturned for a BC couple. On July 29th, 2016, Madam Justice Catherine Bruce ruled the RCMP and trapped the pair, and they were released from custody. For Nuttall's lawyer, Marilyn Sanford, it was the culmination of three years of hard work. When you read Madam Justice Bruce's ruling on entrapment, what was your reaction? It's a very lengthy judgment, but it's, it's a page turner because if you know nothing about the case and you were to pick up this decision, it, it doesn't read like dry law, although the law is all there. It reads like a it, mystery novel. It's, it's a compelling, compelling story. Justice Bruce wrote that the RCMP were justified in surveilling Nuttall and starting Project Souvenir. But in her decision, she ruled the RCMP fabricated the entire plot. 
By any measure, this was a clear case of police manufactured crime. We asked to speak to the RCMP about Project Souvenir, both in Vancouver and here at National Headquarters in Ottawa. But they declined, saying in an email, the RCMP is not in a position to participate as there is an ongoing court process. But Phil Gursky is more than willing to publicly stand up for Project Souvenir. He's a former analyst with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and testified for the Crown at Nuttall and Karodi's trial. I think that what the RCMP did was actually carry out a very, very efficient, very professional, and I would say almost like gold standard investigation into an actual terrorist plot here in Canada. Seriously, gold standard? The way that they handled the source, the way that they, they monitored the, the, the plans of, of Karodi and Nuttall, I think it was absolutely brilliant. But you have the judge saying that Karate and Nuttall weren't capable of carrying out a terrorist plot. You and I are capable of carrying out a terrorist plot. My cat is, is capable of carrying out a terrorist plot. Terrorist plots are not rocket science. These people are not necessarily the sharpest pencils in the box. I think that they were in fact capable. They certainly had the intent. They certainly had the ideology. And they had the capability. Do you think Justice Bruce understands terrorism? Not at all. I, I, I've read the decision and I think she made some uh, I would say fundamental errors in understanding violent radicalization. I think a, a real threat was neutralized. However, internal RCMP emails reveal that some officers were worried that Nuttall was being pressed too hard to come up with a feasible attack plan. On May 8, 2013, a member of the undercover unit wrote, This would be coercion at best, and at worst it would be us making a terrorist out of someone who might not otherwise be. With all of the doubts that were going around in the undercover shop, why take it to the limit? Why go the full distance on this thing? The decision-making authority was removed from the undercover shop where it ordinarily rests, and it was because the uh, investigators were unhappy with how the undercover shop uh, was doing things and, and no doubt unhappy about their reservations about everything. Sanford says operations of this kind are usually planned by the investigative team and carried out by the undercover team, which can decide to pull the plug at any time. But during Project Souvenir, Sanford insists senior members of the investigative team took control of the operation and decided to press on, despite the concerns raised by some undercover officers. It just achieved a momentum of its own and it was going where it was going and nothing was going to stop it. What was his tunnel vision? I, I think it is a classic case of tunnel vision. You'd think the lights would go on at RCMP headquarters or within that unit and saying, uh, guys, they're scared of us. Well, as far as headquarters is concerned, I don't, uh, I don't think they were ever made aware of, of uh, a lot of things that were happening, including that. So how in Ottawa can you assess what's going on if you don't know the details of what Mr. Nuttall and Mr. Ms. Crody were saying behind the scenes? The RCMP officers who did know what was going on kept the operation going, despite what they were seeing in the undercover video and the doubts they were hearing from some of the undercover operators. But in order to keep the operation moving forward, Justice Bruce found the police even broke the law. It was the police who were the leaders of this plot. Not only did the police take over the leadership, but they committed illegal acts to enable the defendants to play their small part in the plan. Karoti's lawyer, Mark Jetty, says the RCMP went far beyond disrupting the plot and actually planned virtually every aspect of it. So to call that the terrorist organization that the police had saved us all from is interesting because it's, uh, it, it's really the terrorist organization that was manufactured bit by bit over the course of this undercover operation. Despite all the criticism, the Crown is appealing Justice Bruce's decision. Both prosecutors and the RCMP maintain that John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi were, in fact, dangerous radicals intent on committing a violent terrorist attack. There really has been an almost defiance that has gone on in regards to this, and that is deeply troubling. Michael Vaughn of the BC Civil Liberties Association was instrumental in getting the undercover video made public. She claims so far there has been no accountability from the RCMP. What should happen with the RCMP? What should the guys at the top be doing? Not what they are doing. Um, what they are doing, at least in their public statements, is continuing to resist. Circle the wagon. Absolutely. There has also been a complaint filed with the RCMP. 
but she believes that's unlikely to produce the change that's needed. She's calling for a government inquiry. In an operation of this scale, it's not usually the kind of police complaint that we see, right? It seems more of the scale that you would say, well, you would have an inquiry about that kind of thing to get to the bottom of this. And the scale of Project Souvenir was enormous. Numbers obtained through a Freedom of Information request filed by W5 show that the RCMP paid out nearly $1 million in overtime to 200 Mounties to staff the investigation. And that doesn't even include the cost of the trial. So why would the RCMP spend those precious resources on an investigation that raised so many red flags? It was apparent from email correspondence that we were able to review um, that uh, national headquarters in Ottawa had an interest in this case. This case was, in fact, a national priority. When you know it's a national priority, is that worrisome in that people may put on horse blinders? Well, that's, that, that's my fear as to what happened here is, is it gets described in those terms and then it sort of gets cemented in those terms. But despite the RCMP's discredited investigation, Phil Gursky believes John Nuttall is still dangerous. Does he get spiritual advice or does he simply spiral down and further down this violent radicalization pathway? Will you and I be sitting here a year from now talking about the fact that John Nuttall somehow acquired a firearm and worked into, worked into, walked into Pacific Place you know, during a convention and went and now there are 15 people dead. I hope we're not having that conversation a year from now. Before you guys ever met these undercover operators, did you ever in your wildest moments think, I want to do a terrorist act? No, never. We certainly didn't want to hurt a bunch of random Canadians on Canada Day who have nothing to do with anything. They're just innocent people going through their daily lives. You did carry out the plot, even though it wasn't real. Maybe we made the wrong decision, but in the end, we were forced into it. It's akin to uh, the fire department going around setting blazes, lighting houses on fire, and then they'll show up in the nick of time to put the fire out, you know, just so they can pat themselves on the back. That's what you think the RCMP did here? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the RCMP did here.